Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ben Keyser with Applied Flow Technology, and I would like to thank you all for joining me today in our webinar this morning. And uh, we certainly appreciate your time listening in with us. And this webinar is being recorded. And so that way, for those of you who are listening in live, you'll receive a link later on this week where you could rewatch the webinar again, or you can share it with your uh, colleagues. Also, if you are listening in live, I have provided a PDF of my presentation for you. So that way you can have that for reference later on. If you are listening into the recorded version, please feel free to email me at benkeiser at aft.com, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of my presentation. So if you're listening to the recording, email me at B-E-N-K-E-I-S-E-R at A-F-T dot com and I'll get you the presentation. So uh, thank you for uh, listening in here and we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. So today I'm going to talk about how to automatically size a piping network with the new AFT Fathom and AFT Arrow ANS module. Uh, the module is still uh, yet to be officially released, but it is getting very, very close to being available, hopefully in the next few weeks here. And we're working very hard on putting on the finishing touches and polishing things up just a little bit more. The uh, version that I'll be showing you today is still in beta phase, so uh, just be aware of that. And uh, once we are releasing the ANS module, if you would like to give it a try, please don't hesitate to contact me, and I'll be happy to give you an evaluation license so that you can try out the ANS module for yourself. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. These are our primary software products that we offer, AFT Fathom, AFT Impulse, and AFT Arrow. I'm not going to uh, discuss these very much today, but what I do want to mention, though, is that once the automated network sizing module is available for AFT Fathom and AFT Arrow, Mercury and Titan will go away because all of the capability of Mercury and Titan are being uh, integrated and expanded and streamlined and simplified into Fathom and Arrow as a new add-on module. So uh, once we come out with ANS, you won't see Mercury and Titan anymore. Now, I'm not going to spend very much more time on the uh, primary products here. If you want to learn more about our individual products, be sure to go to our website, aft.com. And then under the products menu, you can go to the AFT software overview. And this is where you can see a very high level uh, a description of what each product does. And you can click on learn more. And that way you'll get more details about what that particular software product does. So all those are available on our website. I want to get into the uh, meat and potatoes of the webinar today. Now, before I start jumping into the uh, network stuff, I want to talk about some helpful prerequisites, which uh, obviously you will be hard for you to go back and do right before watching today's webinar, but that's okay because uh, I want to make these uh, available to you uh, here in the presentation, which will help guide you in your software education. So uh, one of the webinars that we did earlier this year is – uh, the top 10 AFT features you can't go without. That webinar illustrates how to use really important features and capabilities like the scenario manager, global editing, uh, design alerts, different things like that. So be sure to watch that webinar. Those are some really important capabilities that uh, will dramatically change your uh, modeling capabilities if you learn how to use them. Next is a webinar that we did a few weeks ago on database management and customization. In that webinar, we discussed how to, uh, well, we talked about what databases are. We went over how to create a pipe material database from scratch. 
fluid databases, how to share information in custom databases with other people. And that information can be demonstrated for you in that webinar. There's a link to that in the uh, PDF here. And then I also wrote a few tips and tricks articles a while back on databases. So uh, they're meant to be read in this progressive order. And so if you read those uh, blog articles, you'll have a really good understanding of how to use databases. And the reason why that's important is because when you're using the automated network sizing module or doing cost calculations, databases are a very important part of that process. And so it's important to have a good understanding of databases because you'll be using them all the time when you're doing your automated network site, excuse me, your automated network sizing. Another webinar that I did was how much will your system cost you? That is just a straight uh, cost calculation webinar. So I wasn't trying to minimize any of the costs. I just wanted to demonstrate how to calculate material installation and energy costs for a piping system and demonstrated in that webinar how to build the cost databases from scratch. It's really quick and easy. And I'm going to show it again today in our webinar this morning, but I'm not going to go through step by step. I'll be <laughs> flying through it like I usually do. So if you want to get a good idea of how to build the cost databases, watch that webinar and it'll take you through it a little bit better step by step. Lastly, two weeks ago, I did a webinar, how to automate your pipe sizing calculations. And in that webinar, we talked about more of the uh, basics that are involved to what automated sizing is. So a quick recap of what we discussed in that webinar was, what's the difference between design and analysis? Uh, is AFT Fathom and AFT Arrow, are they design tools? Uh, if you were to use AFT Fathom for a design purpose in pipe sizing, how would you do it? And so for that particular concept, I demonstrated how you'd be able to use Fathom to size a piping system quickly and easily without using the automated network sizing module. But you know, even though it was quick and easy in that example, you can easily see how it would become a lot more difficult when you apply that same process to a piping network where your pipe size combinations can be very different throughout the system. Uh, in addition to simply just meeting your design requirements so that your system works, what else should you keep in mind? Now is another concept that I focused on in the last webinar is when you're using Fathom or a spreadsheet to just calculate what pipe size you need for your piping, all you're trying to do is change the pipe size until your requirements are met. But the question is, is that really the best design that's available? And the answer is that it may not be. And so you have to look at other combinations in order to determine if there's a better design available or not. And that's exactly what ANS is going to do. And to size with a purpose. So not just sizing your pipes to meet your velocities or your pressure requirements, but Let's try and see if we could do a little bit better, maybe minimizing the cost of your system or minimizing the amount of energy costs that your system will experience over a lifetime. So that's what ANS is all about, and we're going to demonstrate that really nicely today. I did do an example last time with the ANS module, and I started off uh, with a uh, spreadsheet. And so what I want to do to kick things off this morning is summarize and conclude the previous example that I did with a single pipe site, uh, pipeline. And then I'll get into a demonstration on how to do pipe sizing for more complicated systems and how to navigate the sizing process. And so this is where all the magic happens. This is the sizing window. It's a new primary window when you turn on the ANS module and the uh, bottom uh, panel here that I have highlighted in this box, this is what will step you through each portion of the pipe sizing process quickly and easily. That way, rather than taking several hours to determine a system design that might be okay, 
A&S will do a really, really good design in a matter of a few minutes. Okay. So back to the automated pipeline size and example that we did uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we considered a 1,000 foot long piping system, which required a design flow rate of 8,000 gallons per minute. The pump flow rate was 8,000 GPM, obviously, and we were assuming a 65% efficiency. We also assumed a uh, constant friction factor of 0.015, and an energy rate of 10 cents per kilowatt hour, and this pipeline would be in service for five years. So there are two scenarios that we wanted to figure out. One is we wanted to determine a pipe size in order to minimize the initial cost for material and installation. We didn't care about the energy costs in that step. They were whatever they were gonna be. We just want the system to be sized as uh, low cost as possible so that it would work. Scenario number two was to determine the pipe size by actually trying to minimize the life cycle costs. So in that scenario, we did actually account for the energy costs of the piping system. So in this particular example, I demonstrated how you can easily size your system with a spreadsheet. And I'll go ahead and open up that spreadsheet here really quick. Uh, give me one sec. Um, so in that spreadsheet there, I determined two different pipeline sizes that could be used for the five-year lifetime. And once my spreadsheet gets opened up, I'll go ahead and bring it over. So here's what we took a look at is in this particular system here, I have my assumptions of, uh, or my knowns, uh, pipe length, flow rate, friction factor, efficiency, energy rate, etc. Next, I've got my pipe costs, which is material and installation costs as a function of the pipe size. Then I also have the costs for my pump. I have the pump costs for energy uh, for material and installation as a function of horsepower so you can do this sizing for a really simple system like a single pipeline in a spreadsheet and so all you would do is just start with your size uh, option and then calculate what your overall dollar cost per foot is over the long pipeline and then you know your flow rate you calculate velocity your head gradient and overall, after you go through all these calculations, you determine how much it's going to cost over the five-year period. So let me switch back to my uh, presentation here. Uh, wrong side. That one. So this is the resulting system that we had when we are only considering material and installation costs. When we're only considering material and installation costs to size that pipeline, we determine a pipe size of 16 inches in diameter. Now, when we added in the energy costs and we sized the pipeline to account for the entire system life cycle, we can see here that we actually need a 24 inch diameter pipeline. So what this looks like in our cost breakdown is uh, I have totaled up the uh, overall sizes. So for a 16 inch pipe size which has about a 13 foot per second velocity our initial cost was $108,000 energy costs were almost $300,000 over five years so the total lifetime uh, system cost there was right under $400,000 so that's what we get if we use a 16 inch pipe size now, if we were to use a 24 inch pipe size, which is the minimum cost when we do the life cycle analysis, the, the, uh, the overall velocity in the system is only six feet per second. So immediately we're still getting a much better velocity. Uh, the initial cost is $142,000. So it does cost more up front for material and installation, but look how well it does on the energy cost basis. $38,000 in five years. 
So your total cost that you'll be paying over five years is only $180,000 for this pipeline versus $400,000 if you were to go with the 16 inch pipe size. So here's the amount of savings. So uh, for your initial cost, you're not saving anything. You're actually spending $34,000 more, but you get a $251,000 savings in energy costs. And overall that would come down to $217,000 in five years. So that's a pretty significant savings in energy there. So what I did in the last webinar after I demonstrated that spreadsheet and the results is I went through the sizing process with the ANS module. So I had the pipeline built in Fathom and then uh, I had my two scenarios. My first scenario here, as you can see, I'm only calculating the energy cost. So I do a calculation for the energy cost, but that's not what I'm basing my sizing on. So I have my two scenarios, sizing based upon initial cost, and then I have my sizing based upon the energy cost over the entire life cycle. So as you can see here, when I was doing my sizing process, I picked monetary cost to try and minimize that. And I want to try and minimize the material and installation as well as the energy cost. I'm not doing anything maintenance cost related in this example here. So I took you through the model building pro or the uh, sizing process and here are the results that we came up with. For a 16 inch diameter system, our costs were right around $435,000 in the long run. So over f the uh, five year period, if we focus on just the upfront costs, it's at $110,000. That is our initial cost for material and installation of the piping and the pumps. But then when we add on the energy cost there, you can see it's going to cost us a lot more in the long run. However, based upon the life cycle cost, I had a 24-inch diameter pipe size. And so for that particular system, my total upfront initial cost was $145,000 for piping and uh, material and insulation in the pumps. And then the total cost in the long run was $185,000. So here's my energy cost of the system. Now, a couple of things I want to point out here. I do want to bring back up the uh, comparison for uh, what we calculated in the spreadsheet versus what Fathom is doing. So this is the calculations of the costs based upon size in our system in the spreadsheet. And then here's what we're getting with AFT Fathom. So I have a question for you. Uh, why are these results different than the spreadsheet? Well, a couple reasons. Fathom uses hydraulic diameters based upon nominal size and wall thickness. It also calculates the actual friction factors based upon your fluid properties. So if we went back to that spreadsheet, I was assuming a straight friction factor where I, wasn't, I didn't need to know anything about the density in that case. And I had my list of pipe sizes, 4-inch, 5-inch, 6-inch, 8-inch, etc. And I was assuming that that size was the hydraulic diameter for those calculations versus in Fathom, it's not. The nominal size is not the actual hydraulic diameter. So that's why we see a difference in results. So Fathom will take into account everything for you. So that's how you'll have a huge advantage in using the ANS module instead of just using a spreadsheet. Now, uh, if you remember, I uh, kind of flubbed at the uh, very end of the webinar when I was trying to show you the sizing calculations. So I went through the entire sizing process and demonstrated what each of these different buttons do. And when I tried to run the, uh, the model, it wouldn't size things properly. I kept getting a uh, message and I couldn't figure out what step I skipped in the process and I went back and I figured it out. So uh, when I was doing the uh, sizing here, 
in the size slash cost assignments, this is where I pick which pipes I want to allow to be able to be sized. So both pipes are going to change their diameters in order to minimize the system cost. The thing that I forgot to do was on the pumps button here, I forgot to include that in the sizing process. So what I forgot to do was I forgot to click on the pumps button and then simply click on include in cost report and sizing. That's <laughs> really all that I needed to do to fix it because initially it was set to do not cost or do not include in cost. I wanted to make sure it's included in the cost and in the sizing process. So that's the step that I forgot to uh, do in the example in last time's webinar. So as you can see, when I remember to do it now, uh, the sizing process goes very, very quickly. It takes less than a second to go through all the different combinations of pipe sizes in order to determine that we need a 16 inch diameter pipe size. And we have our overall cost uh, calculation. So $435,000 uh, in costs. So this is the initial cost minimization scenario. Then if I go to my life cycle cost scenario, this runs just as quickly. And so when we account for the overall life cycle cost, we need 24 inch diameter piping. And we can see that our overall total cost in five years is $185,000. So there you go. That's the step that I forgot to uh, demonstrate was simply by clicking on the size slash cost assignments and clicking on the pumps and including the pump in the sizing report. So, one thing I want to throw out there with this example here is I did not do any design requirements. So I did not mention a minimum velocity or maximum pressure that I had to stay within. I just let the sizing process do whatever it was going to do. And as you can see here, even based upon the spreadsheet, these are some really, really high velocities. And so even when we come out with a minimum pipe sizing cost of 16 inches in diameter, we're still at a velocity of 13 feet per second anyway. So for this pipeline, even though you're wanting to have a lower cost system, you're not going to be able to use that system anyway. If you want to try and achieve six inches or six feet per second as your maximum velocity, you're going to have to do a 24 inch diameter pipe size anyway. And so this is the beauty is that ANS will be able to tell you this information immediately. Okay, so that summarizes the example from last time and, and uh, finishes things up here. So let me go ahead and uh, move on here to the next step of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, missed the button. There we go. All right, so here's what we're going to do today. I have my uh, more complicated piping system where I have two pumps in parallel. I have a couple of control valves and then three heat exchangers in parallel. And so this is my closed piping network that I'm going to automatically size. My initial design, maybe this is from a previous design of a different system that I worked on. And I'm starting off with a guess of eight inches in diameter for all of my pipe sizes and i'm going to let ans change all of them accordingly so for this particular example i'm going to size the pumps and piping for the cooling system scenario one i'm doing just the initial cost sizing scenario two i'm doing the life cycle cost sizing the overall lifetime is 20 years i'm going to create the junction and cost databases from scratch and then the pumps are initially modeled with fixed flow rates for sizing. So in this very first step, when I'm sizing my pipes, I'm also sizing my pumps. I don't have pump curves yet. So I'm just going to do a fixed flow rate through each of these pumps here. When I do that, I would not be able to use a fixed flow rate on the control valves. Once I get pump curves, those will become flow control valves. But right now, I know that 
I have a requirement where my uh, minimum pressure drop across my control valves needs to be 5 PSI at least. So I'm going to model those two control valves as constant pressure drop control. So let me go ahead and open up this example. Now I'm going to basically move my PowerPoint out of the way at this uh, stage, and I'm going to show you the whole process in uh, AFT Fathom itself. And so when you uh, take a look at my presentation down the road, the presentation will walk you through each step of the process. So let me go ahead and open up my Fathom model. takes just a few seconds to open up here okay it's almost there well while that's turning on uh, the way that you will be able to activate the add-on modules is very simple once you get a license you can turn on the ANS module from the tools menu. Here's the tools menu, and if you click on activate modules, then you can check the box for ANS, and that will turn on your automated network sizing module. Once you do that, you'll see a new sizing primary window where all the magic happens for the sizing process. Now, here's something that's a little bit different than what we're normally used to in the checklist. So in our checklist, if something was not completed, we would not expect to see a green check mark telling us that that step is already completed. Well, the thing is, when you first turn on the ANS module, you will actually see this option to define all sizing input as being completed. The reason why is because if I have a Fathom model, now that Fathom is open, I'll actually be able to show you. So let me open up my Fathom model here. Okay, so right now ANS is not yet turned on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the ANS module by clicking on this little button right here next to the status light. This is the other way that you can turn on the ANS module. So if I look at the checklist before and after, you can see what items are included in the checklist. If I click on this box right here to turn on the ANS module, and I click OK, you'll see that there is a new option or a new item in the checklist to find all sizing input and that is actually completed the reason why is because if i don't change anything in this sizing window i could run my model just like doing a regular fathom run and i can actually see what the results of this piping system will be based upon eight inches in diameter piping so that's a key thing that you'll see when you start getting into ANS is that this option will be automatically turned on. So I'm going to hide the checklist. And uh, as you can see here, there are little amper stands all throughout the uh, piping. What the amper stand signs mean is that I have included additional fittings and losses in each of those pipes. So this is my longest pipe in the model right here. And if I open that guy up, it is 700 feet long. And in reality, there's no chance that this pipe is literally going straight from one point to another. So instead of using actual elbow junctions like I've done in a few other areas, I've got maybe a whole bunch more elbows that I want to lump into the system without actually modeling them as junctions. That allows me to simplify my model and still get accurate results. So what I did was I went to the fittings and losses tab, and then I clicked on specify fittings and losses. And for elbows, I've got 15 standard threaded elbows that are 90 degrees. And uh, I don't want to have these be my favorites. There we go. <clears throat> 
so that produces a overall K factor of 6.3. So what this means is in this 700 foot long pipe, I've got 15 elbows in there. And this is the total K factor for additional pressure loss that they're going to include in that long pipe run. And the advantage of this is that I can still size and cost the elbows when they're included as fittings and losses. Now, this isn't just elbows. You can do any of the different uh, minor loss types in the uh, specified fittings and losses, window valves, check valves, orifice plates, etc. So if you lump in these types of minor losses, you can still account for their cost and size them accordingly with your piping network here. And so as you can see, there are several pipes that are relatively long that I've included the additional fittings and losses. So if I go to the fittings and losses tab, you can see which pipes have however many elbows that I've lumped in there. And I want to include all those costs in my system as well. Regarding the pumps, as you can see here, they are set to the sizing option. I've got a fixed flow rate of 3,000 gallons per minute, nominal efficiency of 70%, and a nominal NPSH of 50 feet. So I need to make sure that my NPSH available is decently above that. That's going to be one of my design requirements that, are talk that I'll talk about soon. My control valves are set to be constant pressure drop at a minimum of 5 PSI. Again, once I found pump curves and I replaced the sizing option in the pumps with curves, then I could do a full control valve. The reason why I can't do it right now is, <laughs> well, it's another story for another day, but if you were to try and do flow control in this system, you would see the wonderful reference pressure message. And I'll let you read the help file to understand what that's talking about. Okay, so I have just turned on the ANS module, and I'm going to go through the sizing process here. So when I click on sizing, the very first thing that you need to do is you need to pick your objective for what you actually want to size. So in this particular case, um, I could start by sizing pipe weight. So if you don't have any cost information at all, uh, which could potentially be fairly likely, then you can choose pipe weight as your objective to try and minimize that because piping weight correlates really well with cost. If you reduce the initial weight of the system, that reduces the initial cost of your piping system. So if you don't have any cost information, you can do pipe weight and still automatically size your system automatically meet your design requirements very easily and have a really good design. Now, in my particular case here, I'm going to perform a sizing calculation. If you clicked on the middle button right here to calculate weight, do not size, or let's do this in terms of cost. If I said calculate cost, do not size, this is equivalent to doing a regular Fathom cost calculation example. This is like the cost calculation webinar that I did a few weeks ago. So that's what the middle button does. Now, when I clicked on this option right here, you can see that there's some required input highlighted in blue. If you look down on the sizing panel, there's a little red circle with an exclamation point in it. That means that I now have to specify information for the ANS sizing process. So if I go back into my checklist here, now we will see that the process to define all sizing input is not completed. Now, one thing I want to, uh, one more thing I want to point out is if I said do not size, then clicking on this button is just a regular Fathom run. So it's not doing any sizing, not doing any cost calculations. It's just running Fathom normally. Maybe you want to do this with your initial system and just get a feel for what your results are. So my example today, I'm going to use uh, perform sizing, and I'm going to minimize the monetary cost. Now, for minimizing monetary cost, there are several options. You can either size just for initial cost. That's like the spreadsheet that didn't care about energy costs initially. 
But then this one here is important where I'm still trying to minimize based upon the initial cost, but I do want to know what my energy costs will be. I'm not trying to uh, minimize the energy costs. I just want to calculate them. So for this first scenario, that is the option that I'm going to use is I'm going to use size for initial cost, show energy cost. So when I click on that option right here, this will pick the appropriate options that I need. So my non-recurring costs are material and installation, and those are what I'm going to do my sizing basis off of, is uh, sizing the material and installation costs. And then, as you can see here, uh, the uh, middle column set to cost report only, that's my energy. So I'm only doing an energy cost calculation. I'm not sizing it yet. And then I'm completely ignoring maintenance costs for today. So I turn that on. I would specify a system life, 20 years. And you can do an interest rate or an inflation rate if you want. You can change your units on these. So maybe you want to know what it will look like in several months. Uh, and then my energy cost is going to be $0.11 cents per kilowatt hour. So once I go through and I complete this process and I move on to the next step, what you'll see here is there's a green check mark for my sizing objective, meaning that step is now completed. Okay. So the next thing to do is to do size slash cost assignments. So what this is doing is here, I'm going to specify which pipes that I want to size and which pipes I want to maybe just calculate the cost. So if I want to actually size every single pipe here, then I would need to check all of these bubbles to size them. So that's one option. Now, another option that you have available is maybe there's a handful of pipes where you're not allowed to change your size. They all have to be 12 inches in diameter for whatever reason. Well, if you don't have the flexibility to, uh, to actually let ANS change those sizes, you can click this option right here where you're not sizing them, but you're still including them in the cost. So you'll still calculate how much they'll cost to be in your system, but they're not gonna automatically change their diameter to meet your design requirements. So that's what the sizing and cost assignments window does, is you're specifying which specific pipes you want to allow to be sized or uh, just account for their costs accordingly. Now, in my particular example, I'm going to size everything. So let me, rather than going through and checking each of these boxes individually, there's a much easier way to do it. So what I'm going to do right now to make this a little bit easier is I'm going to hide my quick access panel, and that gives me a little bit more real estate. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my sizing panel, and I'm going to move it over to the side right here, and then I'm going to zoom to fit on the workspace. Now, what I need to do is I need to take all of these pipes, and I need to always include them in the cost and sizing process. So in order to easily do that, what I would do is click on all, and then I would click on always include in cost, and that will move all the buttons here over to this column. So how I do that is I click on all to highlight all of the pipes, and then I'll click on always include in cost, and there we go. So now all of my pipes are going to not only have their costs be calculated, but they're going to be automatically sized as well. So ANS will go through and change the pipe diameters however it needs to change them in order to meet my design requirements. Now, the next thing I want to do is talk about what common size groups are. So as you can see here, I've got 21 pipes on the workspace. So this tells you you got 21 pipes. If I was to just keep this as it is, then ANS would actually change each 
pipe on the system here individually in order to give you the best configuration. That's perfectly fine. You can allow ANS to do that, and it can calculate some really good pipe sizes that will really give you a solid minimum cost. However, um, there's times where you may not want each individual pipe to be a different diameter. So in different parts of your system, you've got some commonalities, like maybe in your uh, pump suction and discharge piping, uh, maybe the pipes that are connected to your heat exchangers, maybe the two pipes that are connected to your pressurizer, uh, et cetera. So when you have certain pipes in the system that you want to be sized but to have the same end diameter, then that's where you would create a common size group. That way it will change the pipe sizes for all of the pipes, but it will change them in the same fashion. They'll all have the same diameter. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to have several different uh, common size groups. And I'm just going over on my slide to for my notes here. Okay, so there, the first two pipes that I'm going to create a size group for is the pressurizer pipe. So these two pipes, I select them on the workspace first, and then when I click on workspace, it will highlight those two pipes, just like I've shown you right here. So now that I've highlighted those two pipes, I'm going to click on new. I'm going to create a new common sizing group. This will be called pressurizer. Now, I have a new common size group called Pressurizer, and what I need to do is I need to click on Workspace again, and I need to move those two pipes into the uh, Pressurizer common size group. So the way that I do that is, again, I'll click on Workspace, and then I will click on Move to Pressurizer. So those two pipes are going to be the same diameter in the sizing process. There's another group that I have is the pump station. And so these pipes right here are going to make up my pump station common size group. So I'll select them on the workspace. I'll click on new and I'll call this pump station. And then when I click on workspace, I just click on move to and then put them in the pump station group, and there we go. Next is I'm going to do my cooler piping. So these pipes right here that are directly connected to each of the heat exchanger junctions, those all need to be the same pipe size. So I select those pipes in the workspace, click on new. This will be called cooler piping, and then click on workspace, move to cooler piping, and there we go. A couple more groups. So I have two sets of header piping for the coolers. I have a set right here, and then I have another set right here. Those <coughs> could be the same diameter if I want, but they might need to be a little bit different diameter. Uh, this might require to be a larger diameter than these two pipes because they're carrying more flow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first select <clears throat> these two pipes right here. And when I select those two pipes, I'm going to create a new uh, common size group called Cooler Headers 1. And I'm going to move those two pipes to Cooler Headers 1. And then I'm going to select these two pipes right here create a new uh, group, cooler headers two. And then if I scroll, I'll click on workspace. If I scroll over and I move these to cooler headers two, there we go. So those two different cooler uh, pipes uh, for the header groups are gonna be different diameters. So I'll give me a little bit more flexibility. Last but not least is pipe 10. So P10 is going to not be in any common size group itself. That's why it's in the not in group column, but it will still be sized. So because that's the only pipe uh, that's by itself, then I'm just going to leave it not in a group and keep it by itself 
and size it in that fashion. Okay, so now I have all of my pipes set up to be sized. And the next thing I need to do is click on my pumps. And I want to include the pumps to be in the cost report and to be sized as well. Again, this is the step that I missed in last, uh, the last webinar. So make sure that you include those to be sized. And then finally, under general junctions, I have the actual elbow junctions on the workspace here that I want to allow to be uh, sized and changed as well. So uh, what I'm going to do here is click on uh, special. Let me circle that for you. So <clears throat> I'll click on special, and this makes it really easy for me to click on junctions of a particular type. So I'll click on junction type, and then for this I'll choose bend, and then select junctions, and they're highlighted for me. So that makes it really quick and easy so I don't have to individually go through and click on the boxes. Now that they're highlighted, I just go to include in cost and uh, report and pipe sizes, and there we go. Okay, now I'm all finished with the size slash cost assignments. I'm gonna save my model. I'm going to lock the panel because if I uh, lock the panel, that prevents me from making any accidental clicks to where I would accidentally move any pipes out of the group. So if I try to click on any of these, it's not going to let me do it because the panel is locked. If I did have an accidental movement, there is a undo option where you can fix that mistake. So uh, after you get everything all set up, it's helpful to lock the panel down. That way you don't make any changes. Now the next thing is to do candidate sets. So what candidate sets are is that these are the allowable pipe materials, sizes, and types that can be selected for sizing my cooler system. So what I need to do first is I need to create a new candidate set. So if I click on new, I'll call this uh, standard steel piping one inch through 36 inch for webinar. Now what I will do next here is I'm going to pick which specific pipes that I'm going to choose to be my candidate set. So as you can see here, um, you can do multiple candidate sets. So you can do copper pipes, steel pipes, other things like that. Uh, hang on one second. Sorry about that, everyone. I had uh, people coming into my office, and to me, that told me that maybe my audio was dying out or something, but uh, it's uh, something I can wait until later. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose steel ANSI pipe, and then, as you can see here, I'm sorting by type and then schedule or type schedule or class. So this makes it really easy because I want to do all standard schedule piping for steel. <clears throat> I don't want to deal with any of these other types. So that's where using this option to sort things by schedule first is really easy. So I'll click on the standard option. And what I'm going to do is just click on standard and click add. And that moves all the sizes with standard schedule over to the list. Now, I only want to do pipe sizes between 1 and 36 inches. So I'm going to select all these pipe sizes I don't care about, and I'm going to remove them from the list here. So I just select them and then click Delete, and now I've got my 1 inch to 36 inch uh, list of pipes. So if I expand this, you can see all the pipes that exist in that candidate set. And what I need to do next is assign this candidate set to specific common size groups. This is what I was talking about, how you can do multiple candidate sets. Because maybe some pipe common size groups need to be steel, and then maybe others need to be HDPE or copper or stainless steel, uh, whatever you might have. So that's how you can do multiple candidate sets and how you would specify which candidate sets goes with which specific common size group. 
So here I'm going to make all of these common size groups use my single candidate set here. So now that I do that, that step is finished. So I've got my candidate sets all assigned and I'm going to save my model. <clears throat> the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define my design requirements. The design requirements are what will drive your design. So these are things like you have to stay below a certain velocity, or maybe your piping network has to be above a certain minimum pressure. Maybe you have a minimum flow rate that you need to accomplish, or a uh, minimum MPSH margin, things like that. So <clears throat> you can do as many design requirements as you want, for pipes and junctions and that's what will drive the sizing process in order to figure out which type of pipe sizes you need if you think back to the single pipeline example that i did we came up with two different sizes 16 inch and 24 inch well based upon the 16 inch pipe size i needed a 13 foot per second velocity that's way too high so if i would have put a design requirement for six feet per second that would change my design and that would force me to use 24 inches because 16 inch diameter pipe would violate the design requirement in that case so here i'm going to do four different design requirements well actually there's five the uh, fifth design requirement is the minimum pressure drop across the control valves that's already set up as a fixed dp so i won't need to do a control valve design requirement yet so in this first process here when i'm sizing the pipes and the pumps i am only going to do four design requirements later once i would get a pump curve then that's where my control valve uh design requirement would become important so i would click on new and we'll give it a name so this will be called uh minimum velocity so my minimum velocity is going to use the parameter velocity of course and it's going to be oops i uh called that the wrong thing so i'm going to rename this <laughs> maximum velocity there we go all right so i want to have a maximum velocity of 12 feet per second and that maximum velocity is going to apply to every single pipe and every single common size group. So I'm applying all of the uh, pipes to have a velocity under 12 feet per second. My next design requirement is going to be minimum pressure. So my minimum pressure design requirement is going to be a overall pressure. So that means I want the inlet and outlet of every pipe everywhere in the system to be above a minimum of 15 psi a so make sure you choose your correct units here and again that's going to apply to all the pipes here <clears throat> my third design requirement is i need to make sure that i get a minimum flow rate of 1900 gallons per minute through each heat exchanger now we don't have uh, heat exchanger design requirements here so what you would do is you would do a design requirement on the pipes themselves that are connected to the heat exchangers so here's how i'll do this is i will click on new and i'll call this minimum cooler flow and this is going to be based upon volumetric flow rate and it's the minimum that I need, which is 1,900 gallons per minute. And this is going to apply to only one common size group, cooler piping. So this is where I'm only checking one box for this specific design requirement. It does not apply to any of the other pipes in the rest of the system. There's one last design requirement, and that's going to be for the pumps. I want to make sure that whatever sizing that ans comes up with i want to make sure that my pumps have plenty of npsh available so in order to do that i'm going to do a npsh margin design requirement so i'll click on new and i'll call this uh 
minimum NPSHA margin. And the parameter for pumps is going to be NPSH margin. And the minimum value is going to be 10 feet. So I need to make sure that my NPSH margin gives at least 10 feet of NPSH available above the 50 foot required NPSHR. So I now have my four design requirements and that's all set up and ready to go. So now I'm going to lock this panel down to prevent any accidental changes. I'm going to save my model. The next thing is to go on to assign cost databases. <clears throat> so this is where we need to assign the costs of our system. And for doing this here, uh, I am going to create the uh, databases from scratch. And so let me go ahead and open up my spreadsheet where I've got my cost information. And uh, you'll see what the costs are. Now, if I had already created uh, cost databases, I could just connect them really quick, but I've not done that, so I need to build them from scratch. So as you can see here, I've got my pump and in material and installation cost. I have the costs for my elbows, and then finally, I have my piping cost. And for my piping cost, I've got it set up for only the 1 inch to 36 inch diameter. So those are my material and installation costs there, and that's what I'm going to use. So what I'm going to do here is first I'm going to do my uh, piping costs. So in order to do that, I'm going to click on Edit Cost Databases, and I'm going to create a new cost database. So I'll click on New, and this is where you associate a cost database with an engineering database. So it needs to apply to the steel ANSI piping. So I'll select that, and then I give it a description. So this will be called uh, Pipe Material and Installation Costs for Webinar. And I'll save that, and we'll give it a name called uh, pipe and material for cooling system. Next thing is to go to the pipe materials tab. <clears throat> I'm going to sort this by material and then type and then size. That way I can do everything for a standard schedule. Now I've already exported my uh, format that I need for re-importing the costs. So if you watch the cost calculation webinar, uh, what I did previously was I did a export to Excel. It exported this format, and that's essentially how I got this. What I did then was I deleted all these rows that I don't have cost information for, <clears throat> and then I now have this uh, uh, this spreadsheet where I have just the one inch to thirty six inch diameter range and I'm going to import the costs from this spreadsheet. So now when I go back into Fathom here, I'll click on import from Excel and I would choose my spreadsheet which is going to be pipe cost format. And if you just give it a couple of seconds, it'll import all the costs for me. There we go. So if I click on the one inch size, I can see I've got material and installation, and if I keep going through each of these, I've got all my costs imported completely. So now I'll save that database, and I'll close it. And so now, as you can see, the database window here has changed. So for my pipes, I'm assigning my candidate set to use the cost pipe material database that I just created. Now I know that I'm one minute to the hour and so I'm going to keep on going here. And so if you're able to stay with me and hang in there for a few more minutes, you'll be able to see the rest of the process and I appreciate that. If you have to uh, head out, <clears throat> that's perfectly fine. I, I certainly understand and I appreciate you listening in, in with me today. You can then uh, watch the recording of the webinar later. 
just zoom ahead to about the uh, one hour mark and you can pick up wherever you left off. So if you need to head out, then feel free. If you're able to stay, then we'll uh, finish getting through this together. So I'm going to keep on going here. I've got my uh, pipe, cost, uh, pipe cost materials all set up. So as you can see here, my pipe material and insulation cost database is created. So I'll close that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a cost database for my pumps. Now, before I do a cost database, I have to take these pumps on the workspace and add them to a database because, again, the cost has to be associated with an engineering database. So this is really easy. I'll just go into this pump right here, and I open it up. <clears throat> All the information stays the same, and I'll click OK. And with that junction selected, I'll click on database, and then uh, I'll click on component database, and this is where I give it a name. So this is going to be called, uh, I'm going to change the name. Let's see. Let me delete that. Okay, let's try this again. So I'll select it, and then... Uh, Let's see here. There we go. Add component to database. So I'll call this uh, pump for webinar cooling system. So now that I made that a custom component, it's now using the database list for the information. And then I'll set the second pump to be the same. So this is going to use the database for the information here. Now I can go in and create my cost databases for the uh, pump. So I'll move that back to the side here. So now I'm going to click on Edit Cost Database. And I'm going to click on New. And the location of where that custom component is, is in my local user database. So I'll select that as my engineering database for the pump. And I'll click on Select. And I'll give it a description. Pump, material, and installation costs. We'll save it. Give it a name. Pump, and uh, material, and installation for cooling system. So now I'll click on junctions and it's going to use this pump here. And what I'm going to do is create some cost tables. So let me bring back over my uh, spreadsheet, which has my costs for pump material as well as installation based upon horsepower. So I'll move that to the side. I'm going to create a new cost table. It'll be based upon power versus cost. This is called pump material. And then I simply go to my spreadsheet, copy the data, and then I'll paste it in, and I'll do a new one, pump installation, power, cost, click OK, and then I'll select my data and uh, paste it in, and there we go. So now I've got my two cost tables. Now I select on my pump webinar for cooling system and i'll do my two costs pump material pump installation change this to installation and i'm going to use my new table of costs that i just created pump material pump installation and save and close so now both of the pumps will use the uh this database all right so now <clears throat> what i need to do is two sets of elbow costs so the first one i'm going to do is for the actual elbow junctions themselves so what i need to do is the same thing i did for the pumps i selected elbow i'm going to use the standard elbow 90 degrees and click ok and then i'm going to add that component to database I'm going to call it uh, bend uh, junction uh, 
for cooling system. So now that that is in that database, I go through here and I make sure that each elbow is using this database set. I can do a global edit for that operation here. So edit, global junction edit, and then for all my elbows, they're all going to use this information here. I'm going to click on database source. And so now if I right click, we'll see that it's using my databases for each of those elbow junctions. Now I can create a cost database for the elbow junctions. So I'll go to database, cost database, and I'm going to click on new. And that information exists in the Fathom local user database. And I'll call this bend junction costs for webinar. <coughs> Save it. Bend junction costs for cooling system. All right, so now I click on junctions. Now I've got my bend junction there. I'm going to do the same idea with cost tables here. So this will be diameter versus cost. This will be called bend junction material. And I'll go into my spreadsheet here and I'll copy those costs and then come in and paste that information. And I'll do one more table, bend uh, junction installation, diameter versus cost, get the information from my spreadsheet, copy it, paste it in, and now I go back to the junctions tab. And so for my bend junction, I've got my two costs, bend junction material, bend junction installation and then I'll choose my uh, cost tables here bend junction material bend junction installation save it and close last thing is for the fittings that I have inputted into each of the pipes here these are included in the internal Fathom default database. So that's going to be the uh, engineering database for my elbow fitting costs to apply to. So now when I click on the cost database for my fittings and losses, I'll click on new. It's going to use the AFT default internal database. So I select that and I'll call this bend uh, fittings material and installation costs and then when I save it I'll call this bend fitting costs for cooling system and I'll do the same process so I'll create my cost scale tables first so the first one is going to be the material so I'll call this bend fitting material paste it in and then I'll call the second one bend fitting installation <clears throat> the reason why I'm using fitting versus junction is that way my cost databases can distinguish between which one has been used as a junction versus which one has been simply lumped in as an additional fitting and loss so now I go to the fittings and losses tab. This is where we have to drill down a little bit. So I go to elbow, standard threaded, general, 90 degrees. The cost information is going to be based upon that fitting. So I'll do my two new costs. So this will be bend fitting material, and this will be called bend fitting installation. And then I'll pick installation here. And then steel, that's going to be the material that it's based off of. All sizes and types. We're going to use my cost tables that I just made. Fitting material, fitting installation. And there we go. Save that. And then we'll close it. 
So now if we open up the database manager and we look at all the connected databases, we can see that we've got four cost databases. I've got my fittings for the elbows. I have my junction elbow costs, my pump costs, and my piping costs, all connected and ready to go. So now, so I go through here and I make sure that my uh, pipes are using uh, just one of these. So I'm going to uncheck these boxes here. And then for my uh, pumps, it's going to use just the pump material, not pipes. And then for general junctions, this is where my elbow uh, as junctions are going to use these costs here. Just like that. Okay. So I have all of my uh, cost databases assigned. The last step is to pick my sizing method. So here I'm just going to keep the default and we want to do discrete sizing because we don't want to end up with a pipe size which is like 8.736 inches in diameter. That's not a standard pipe size that you could just go out and buy. So it's best to do discrete sizing. That way it will pick a standard size that you can actually get. So now that that is all set up, if I went through each process correctly, <coughs> It should, uh, let's see. So it's running the uh, sizing process. It's going through to figure out which uh, pipe size that I need. And uh, it should do this a little bit quicker here. Let's see, maybe I missed something. So I've got my junction costs. I've got my pump material and installation costs. And then for the pipes, I'm using the database source for all of the elbows. See if that fixed it. So what Fat what Fathom ANS is doing first is even though I chose discrete sizing, initially it starts off with doing a continuous sizing anyway, because this can give a good uh, starting point for Fathom to start with, <clears throat> and then uh, that way it helps it find the true actual discrete sizing a little bit better. Now the thing, uh, the reason why this is taking a little bit longer than a regular Fathom run is because ANS is literally going through thousands and thousands of different combinations of pipe sizes that can be used in order to truly find the best design that is possible and making sure that all of my design requirements are met. So it looks like everything's finished here. So let me go ahead and click on the output window and let's take a look and see what it was able to accomplish here. All right, so here's my cost report. That's one of the important things that I want to pay attention to. So for my cost report, I'm going to collapse that back. So my system up front, it's initially costing $751,000. As you can see, that is my piping material and insulation cost. I have my elbow junction material and insulation cost, my pump material and insulation cost, and the fittings that I lumped into the pipes material and insulation cost. All that adds up to that $751,000. Now, the cost that dominates over the 20-year period is the energy and operational cost. So $3.3 million dollars to run this system over 20 years. So we're at 4.1 or almost $4.1 million. 
Now let's take a look and see what the ranging pipe sizes are. So if I go to pipe sizes and then sizing, this will tell you how the pipes are sized throughout the network. So it changes each of the pipes based upon their common size groups. And that's how I have my pipe sizing uh, completed in my system. Now we want to take a look at the design requirements. So this gives you information as to which design requirements were really, excuse me, impacting the design. As you can see, my design requirement for minimum pressure was not really important because all of my, excuse me, all my pipes were naturally over this uh, design requirement here. So <clears throat> I may not even need to use that design requirement at all because they will just naturally be inherently over 15 PSIA. And then I also have my uh, pump design requirements. So you can see that your uh, MPSH is above the required margin. So that's good. So this is based upon minimizing the initial cost. Now I'm going to just really quick do a life cycle cost scenario. So in order to do a life cycle cost, all I need to do is change one thing. When I go in here to sizing, all I need to do is choose size for initial and recurring cost. So as you can see, it's accounting for all three of those in the sizing calculation. So if I do that, all of my uh, candidate sets and common size groups are all set up. My candidate sets are still the same. My design requirements are still the same. There's my pump design requirement, my pipe design requirement. I've got my appropriate uh, databases employed for each of the sizing methods here. And so now I'm going to size my system based upon life cycle. And we're going to see what this saves us. So if we try to minimize the size uh, or minimize the cost over the entire life cycle of the system, how much money can that save us? Well, <laughs> only took 13 seconds. Let's take a look here and see what we got. So if I go to my cost report, Look at that, $3.3 million for the overall total cost. So if I compare that to the previous scenario, my previous scenario, uh, the total cost was at $4.04 million versus three point whatever it was, I can't remember. Uh, 3.3 .3 million. So that's a massive amount of savings there, hundreds of thousand dollars. Now, as you can see here, this initial cost right here is significantly above the $750,000, but I've saved tons of amounts of money in the long run on those energy costs. And so that's what my site, my system costs look like. Let's take a look at the sizing that I need. And of course, it's going to pick bigger pipe sizes. So it ranges from 14 inches in diameter up to 24 inches in diameter. And that's my system. And then we can take a look at the design requirements. Everything was met nicely by minimizing based upon life cycle. And I've got plenty of MPSH margin available. So that's the difference between doing a initial cost sizing and a life cycle cost sizing. And that's how you step through the process for each of these different steps when you're going through and doing your uh, automated network sizing. Now, things I did not talk about was dependent design cases. That's another topic for another day. So be sure to stay tuned to our webinars. Once the ANS module is officially released, and available, we'll be doing about at least one ANS webinar a month in addition to the webinars that we're already doing. So we'll be teaching a lot more about the module and what it can do and how you can use it. And it's a great tool. It's going to help you automatically uh, size your pipes very, very quickly and 
uh, it'll automatically meet your design requirements. That way you don't have to do it manually anymore. And this will save you tons of time and tons of effort and it'll help you really save a lot of money in the long run. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. I really appreciate you all listening in. And take care, and I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your week.